and it's upside down. Hello, Bluetooth from around the world. My name is Kais, and I'm 11 years old, and I live in Montreal, Canada. Welcome to our Wood Zoom session, where me and my co-host, Tala, who is 11 years old and lives in Toronto, will be interviewing our guest changemaker, Rudina. Rudina lives in The Hague in Netherlands. She is the founder of Zeki, a charity that ensures refugee education through e-learning. They collect donations of secondhand devices, fix them, and load them with educational content that is accessible both online and offline. Rudina's work contributes to several sustainable development goals, but more particularly, number four, quality education. Tala will be asking questions to Rudina about her background, her journey, her work, her skills, and her impact. We hope that you will enjoy this session. I will now hand it over to Tala to start the interview. Good morning. Um, Rudina, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, Tala and Kais. Kais, for having me here. My name is Rudina Abdo. And as I said, I am living in the Netherlands, in The Hague, and I'm from many different places, lots of different places and identities, so I'll keep it simple. So to start from when your background, when you were little, what kind of sports did you play while you were growing up? Um, I was, I ran, so I was on the cross country team, even though I wasn't a very good runner back then but I persisted and I, I would go running. I would run a lot. I was in a British school, so we had netball and I was on the netball team. Netball is similar to basketball, but a lot gentler and there's no contact between people. You have, there's a three foot rule, so you can't come to be beyond three feet between players and there isn't a backboard to the, to the, the hoop. So, um, uh, so I played that and then we also started playing basketball and I was on the basketball team and we would play basketball against the American school and then we go play netball against the British school and we'd get fouled all the time <laughs> because basketball is a rougher game is a more active game. So yeah, these were my three sports in, in growing up. So were there any people that had a big impact on you while growing up? Yeah, um, I would. I have two cousins who had my cousins actually a lot of cousins, but I, I'm going to pick two in particular or two specific cases. One was uh, my cousin Huda, and she was uh, she's seven years older than me actually. And when I was in middle school, I think I would trail her everywhere, and uh, she was uh, she is an artist, so she would go to the art she had a very good relationship with the art teacher he was she was a really good art student so the art teacher would open up the art room on saturdays to uh, whoever wanted to come in and usually it was the high schoolers but since i was always shadowing her i would be a drag along and i go for hours with her to the art room and sit and draw and sketch and that's when um i started my my love for art which later followed me a little bit into my career. So yeah, that was somebody who was a big influence on me, I'd say, growing up. So right now, what or who motivates you? Who, what motivates me? I would say doing work that has, that's doing good. And I, I know lots of people talk about that, social good, impact work, but I, we have, we, we can be so deliberate in what we do, or we can just do work because it's what lands in our laps, it's the job that we get. Um, so for me, I, I'm becoming much more intentional in the kind of work that I'm doing. And to I'm working right now with education and children, which is not what I studied to do, which is not what my whole career was about but it relates to what was happening um, in the Middle East as well with wars and refugees. And I just felt I had to do something about this other, th <clears throat> other than just watch the news and have my heart broken. So motivates me is bringing, working in areas of hope, working in areas that, have, um, that are working towards positive outcome to people, to the environment, to the planet that we live on, because we've really treated it so badly 
and we, we need to do something about that. Yeah. So do you have any hobbies outside of your work? Mm -hmm. Um, do I have a life outside of my work? No. <laughs> my hobbies, well, I'm, I still run. So I'm, I run a lot. Uh, that's still something that is uh, embedded into my schedule, almost daily schedule. Um, hobbies, I love to travel. And I know that's not very good for the carbon footprint part, but I do love to travel. I love to visit new countries, new places, new food, new experiences. So I consider travel to be part of my education. <laughs> so now that we are in COVID lockdown mode or limited travel, it's, it's different, obviously. Um, and since we are in COVID lockdown mode, I've been cooking more and doing a lot of stuff with uh, baking. I started this um, starter because there was no yeast. And now my family has to put up with all kinds of baked things that I make most of which are not very good but i have fun experimenting and i do not follow recipes and that kind of drives my kids crazy but i i don't follow recipes i make up my own sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't so where do you usually work before covid and right now during covid actually for me there was no change no difference i've been working remotely from my home predominantly from my home for the last almost five years, four or five years. Uh, I was working in office environments before then. And once since I started Becky, I've been home-based. Um, I've done a little bit of co-working space where at one point I felt I just had to need, I had to see adult humans at some point. So I was doing a little bit of uh, one, one day a week of co-working space, which was nice. It was a nice change, but I've been working from home and I've moved into a room that's very close to, you can see there's a lot of light on me now because I'm in a room that's right next to the window that's south facing. And to me, that makes a huge difference to have natural light, especially in the Northern climate that I live in now. So pre post COVID has been the same for me. So how do you create a good workspace for yourself since you work at home? Yeah, well, I, my, my needs are actually quite simple. I just need a space for my laptop. I've actually, right now, I'm on a very small camping table, believe it or not, um, uh, because it fits nicely next to the window. And it's, I'm in a comfortable low chair and my legs hang comfortably. So I don't, they're not having, they don't hit the knee at the wrong place. So this is part of the ergonomic setup. Um, and I put this thing here that's that is it's like this storage unit that is between me and the door so that if people do barge in by mistake and open the door it's i still feel like i have my cocoon in here i've got my own secluded space um and it's my laptop that's my my office and i unplug it and take it to different parts of the house in the evenings because i i tend to work all the time <laughs> so it, the the office moves along with me but I have a space that's with the door and uh, the family generally knows that if the door is closed, they shouldn't come barging in. And they generally know that they shouldn't be making loud noises if, if I'm on a call. Doesn't always work, but sometimes. So what is your favorite part of living in The Hague? Nature. It's uh, absolutely beautiful from a nature perspective. Uh, and the way they do uh, city, the city planning, city development. I'm an urban planner by profession. So this is what I studied and this is what my career was in. So um, I guess I'm, I'm sensitive to how communities are built and such. So here in The Hague, there are, in the Netherlands, actually all across the Netherlands because of the way um, the country, it's Netherlands, lower lands is what it is. So I think it's 40% of the country is underwater, under sea level. So uh, there are a lot of canals and these canals help with flood mitigation so that you don't have flooding happening in the country. And these canals mean that there's these beautiful water bodies that are in every neighborhood. When I go on my run, I'm go running along water almost the entire time. So we just passed spring a couple of uh, months ago and we saw uh, baby swans, baby geese, baby ducks, baby 
uh, there were lambs, sheep, and my husband even saw a cow being born. And that's just around the corner from our house. And this is all while being in the city. So you have all of this nature in the city with so much greenery um, and it's so lush. And just a kilometer and a half away from us is the coastline and the Dutch coastline is uh, the, the Netherlands is on, uh, on the water. So you have a massive coastline that longs, runs along the entire country. And it's a very wide beach with dunes, generally very windy, but it's also very beautiful. So all of this is at my doorstep and I think it's beautiful. And I have to add the other thing on the mobility side, which is really, it's every time I'm doing it, which is all the time, I'm, I, it hits me just how, how fortunate we are, which is biking. We bike everywhere. So we have more bikes than people in the house, I think. A double, maybe, two to one ratio almost. And we got rid of our car. We don't even have a car because we don't use a car. So we get around purely on our bikes if it's within our town or if we need to go to another town or another city, we take the train. So I love that. And it was the best thing when we gave up the car. I don't miss it for one minute. So yeah, these are the advantages of living in the Netherlands. Yeah. So when you made Becky, what did you want to accomplish? When uh, I was very upset with what was going on when I started Becky, this was at the when the Syrian refugee crisis was everywhere. I mean, it was so it was in the news. You could not escape it. What was happening and with the Arab Spring and just so much um, disruption, so much violence, so much displacement happening um, in the Middle East and in, in the region where I come from. And I, as a result, people were being displaced, settling in places, and children were losing out on their education. They weren't going to school. And to me, that was just a, a wrong that had to be righted. This is, the, it cannot be. So my hope was to, and not only that there is that, that children need to be educated, but here we are speaking on this platform in a digital way. Here we are in a COVID lockdown where we can't go to school. We haven't been going to schools. We haven't been going to work, but we're able to continue working. We're able to continue studying because we've got technology to help us to do that. And we're communicating across three different cities right now, two different countries. And uh, we can do that because we've got the technology, we've got the connectivity. Well, 46% of the planet doesn't have connectivity. Um, so there is a huge divide in so many ways. And the technology and education are two of those divides. And I think technology can really help with education. And I wanted to do something about that. I wanted to see how we can use technology to help with the education of children who are not going, missing out on their education entirely. And if they miss out on their education, they've lost their future. They've missed out, missed out on opportunities for their future. And that's not right. So that's, that's what motivated me to start Becky. So you said that you were helping refugees. What kind of refugees are you helping? We're working mostly, most of our work is in Lebanon. It's all in the Middle East, mostly in Lebanon, a little bit in uh, Jordan, and we're going to hopefully start soon in Palestine. Um, and it's, it's actually not just refugees, it's pr predominantly refugees and predominantly Syrian refugees. There are some Palestinian refugees that we help but it's also a lot of Lebanese um, vulnerable communities as well Lebanese children who are who don't have the tools who don't have access or who don't have um, digital and education so it's those who need the help the most are those who are where we're stepping in so what is the hardest thing that you have to do in your job the hardest thing is there are different challenges at different times so right now, what we do, the basis of what we do is that we get laptops that, as Qais said earlier, we get laptops from organizations like companies and universities that don't, are no longer using their laptops, but they're still good. 
So there's still laptops that, that function well, but they're no longer using them. So they donate them to us, we do stuff to them, and then we put a lot of stuff on them, educational content, ga educational games, software programs, and then we get them to the organizations and the kids who, who, who are going to be using technology probably for the first time. So right now, our biggest challenge, the hardest thing, is getting the, the thousands of laptops that we need. So, um, and now with COVID-19 going on and everybody being locked up, there is a lot of demand for laptops everywhere in the world. So it's even harder to get them now, but you know, a hard challenge never stopped me before. So we're working hard to, to, get, lap, to get laptops, but this is our biggest challenge. Yeah. So is Becky a nonprofit organization? Yes. Becky is a nonprofit organization, which means that any money that we make, if there was to be excess money that, uh, that we make, which at this point there isn't, but if there were to be excess money, it doesn't go into our pockets as earnings, it goes back into the organization. So why did you decide to make Becky a nonprofit organization? Because I think, uh, because of the way that we operate, because of the mission, that that we are working with refugees and vulnerable communities and we get a lot of donations and we get support from other companies it's not just donations we get support from companies who are helping us on the tech side and on the design side and on the digital side um, in many ways on the on the shipping side so they wouldn't be so willing to do that if an organization isn't doing it for social good as a non or as a nonprofit, it's easy. It's better to be operating in this field as a nonprofit organization because of the mission. So, since you said that all of your money doesn't go, like all of your extra money doesn't go to you, how are you making money? Hmm. Um, well, I very personally am making no money, but I have a team that's making <laughs> that's that's pay that's ma making money, and we have we've got two ways of making money. We the laptops that we get and we put a lot of content on them from educational content like um, things from National Geographic and things from Oxford University Press and and a lot of content in Arabic and there's a lot of work that goes into putting it there. So we need to pay people to, to put that content there. So the, um, when we first, at the very beginning, we were giving the laptops away, but we can't survive that way. We cannot be cash negative, which means that it costs us more to operate it than, than it, it does to exist. So we start, we charge a small fee for each laptop that gets, that goes. So that's one way of making money. And the more laptops that we have, the more devices that are out there, the, the more revenue that we'll get that will be able to sustain us. And the other way is that we get grants and gifts. So um, organizations have given us money because of the work that we do and individuals and corporations have also given us some money to allow us to do the work that we do. So right now, are you working with a team or are you working independently? No, I've got a team. It's actually, we've got quite a big team. So there are people who are on staff, which means that they're there either full-time or part-time, but they're, they're there continuously. We have a lot of volunteers who are also there, but in smaller capacity or they come and they go. Uh, this summer, we actually have six university interns, which means there are six uh, students in different universities around the world who are working with us for two months full time. Um, and we have a board of advisors and they also help and uh, a few consultants. So actually, if you count all of us up, I think we're over 20. We're between 20, 25 people between staff and volunteers. Yeah. So which university did you go to? I, as an undergraduate, I went to MIT and I studied architecture. And for graduate school, I went to McGill University and I studied urban planning. And then my career after that was in urban planning until I started Becky. <laughs> but I still, I'm still an urban planner. That's still my, my DNA. Um, so how much do you think you have helped by creating Becky? Yeah, I think we've, we've made 
Uh, we've helped. I think we've made a, a, quite a difference and we measure the help that we do with surveys that we, we conduct and with interviews and with going in in the field. Um, and our estimate, we think that we, it's about 9,000 children who have touched a Deki laptop, who have had some kind of access to a Deki laptop since we started. And we hope to reach many more tens or hundreds of thousands of children but we also want to do it in a very in a quality way because we spend a lot of time and effort with in uh, getting those laptops ready and put and putting the content on them and how they and how they the user interface is, is what it's called so how you navigate those computers so right now is there anybody that um keeps you mo motivated and inspires you to keep doing your work yeah, I think I would say a big inspiration is somebody that stems from my childhood. And I think that's probably what also got, got me started into thinking about the humanitarian world in the first place. Uh, she's, she's deceased now, she's passed away, but she is um, the daughter of somebody, of, um, of a woman who started in 1940, way before my parents, I, even my mom was born actually, she started an organization in Palestine in Jerusalem called the Four Homes of Mercy. Uh, and it, the way she started it is that her friend, I think our neighbor had um, a child with disabilities, with severe disability, and she passed away and she asked this woman to take care of her child. And that's what started her on a mission of helping children and uh, who were um, uh, had had uh, difficulties and she started a home called the four homes of mercy and that organization was very close was i was exposed to it growing up because it's close to the family and i was always and i met the daughter of the founder who then ran it for decades and she was she was such an inspiration for me from when I was a child and growing up about how how gentle she was how how giving she was how much of herself she gave her entire life uh, on a mission to help um, it's not just children it's actually children to adults who had disability or who had no uh, opportunity they wouldn't have been cared for had it not been for her organization stepping in. So her name was Henriette Siksik, and I would say that she's probably my biggest inspiration. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. She was an incredible woman. Kais, is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, but uh, yeah, I have one last question. So before we end our interview, one last question. Do you have any advice for young people who would like to be change makers? Yeah, I would say, don't be afraid. First of all, if you've got ideas, if you've got an idea, put it out there, work on it, and don't give up on it. So if something you're gonna, something's gonna be hard, or it's gonna uh, not go as you planned, don't let that be the stopping point. Keep pushing beyond that and see where that will take you. And it may take you somewhere entirely different. So be allow yourself to be flexible, but at the same time. If it feels that this is really what I want to do, no, I'm, you know, I'm just convinced that this is going to work. Keep at it. Don't give up just because things get difficult. So act and then don't give up and work collaboratively with others. I think there's a lot in the way, yeah, you probably in your school systems, I think school systems in general, there's just so much competition out there that uh, who's going to get the award, who gets the top prize, who gets a great grade. And this is how we've all been geared towards doing things. And I really wish that we would move away from that. I wish that we would move towards much more of a collaboration with, with that, this cutthroat competitive, competitiveness that happens. So go after your gut, work hard, and collaborate. All right. Thank you, Redina. And thank you, Kaya, or Tala, <laughs> for the great discussion and for all the things we learned today. Thank you, Voodoo, for listening to this interview. And make sure to follow us on Instagram and to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can hear about upcoming interviews with other changemakers. Please also tell your friends about the Voodoo. And last but not least, 
don't forget to take our quiz on www.abu.co in order to collect the Abu badge. Thank That's you. It.